All right, welcome to Managing Diversity Dynamics in Our Politics. We'll go ahead and get started at this time. Before I turn things over to our speaker, Howard Ross, I do want to let you know that this session is being recorded and will be posted onto the website. All right, well, Howard, over to you. Great, thank you, Helen, and hi, everybody. Um, really uh, appreciate everybody being here for what I think is a very important conversation and a conversation that all of us are concerned about, which is how this um, political campaign and uh, maybe politics in general are affecting our lives, uh, our communities, and even our workplaces. And I know that, um, like, like I'm sure many of you, I'm feeling the effects of these months and months and months of this campaign. And as we reach the, the end of it, or maybe the end of this phase of it, um, I think it's important for us to take a look at what we can learn from it about ourselves, about the way we do politics, and, and most importantly, what we can look at um, might be things that we can do to help heal some of the rifts that have come up as a result of the work that we're doing. So I thought we'd start by just seeing, you know, who's with us on the call. Um, you know, we've got, um, at this point, about 85 people already checked in. I expect that we'll have more. We had over 200 registered, so people will probably be tricking, trickling in. But um, so we're going to do, I know that some of you will probably wince when you hear this term, but yes, we're going to do another poll. Um, this one, however, won't be put out in the media for people to determine whether they like it or not. This will just for our uses. So and let's start by saying, if you were to generally describe your political affiliation, would you describe yourself as any of these five, Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian Party, or, or Independent? And, and actually, I guess we could have other. If you have other, please feel free to send it in into the notes section, um, and we'll be able to see that. So if you see on the right-hand side, Helen, if you could just remind everybody how to do the polling. Sure, it looks like most people already figured that out. Just select your response and then click on Submit in the lower right corner of the screen. Okay. I'll give folks a couple more seconds to determine. All right, the poll will be automatically closing in just a moment here. And, okay. um, and, and just to give you a heads up, Howard, most people have selected Democrat. Okay, good. And probably not a surprise given that, you know, people are coming from an orientation towards knowing us as a diversity company, and I think that that's true. And, uh, so yes, we can see 75% on the call, 12% independents, and um, only 7% Republicans. So it's important for us to know that we we have a, a skewed group to one particular direction. But I, I, nonetheless, I think that the things we're going to be talking about are going to, will be very valuable. And since we're not going to be engaging with each other, uh, we don't lose that perspective quite as much. But please do send notes in or questions as we continue to talk. Let's let's say one on one other question, and that is. Who do you currently plan on voting for in the presidential election? It'll be interesting to see how this compares to our uh, the question of who we associate with. So do you plan on voting for Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Gary Johnson, Jill Stein, Evan McMullen, somebody else? If you're unsure, or are you just going to sit this one out and stay home? For those of you who may be new to joining us, just so while, we're, while you're voting, um, Cook Ross is an organizational transformation uh, company. We're based in Silver Spring, Maryland, and we do work in issues of organizational culture development, leadership, and diversity and inclusion. And I know a lot of you know us for our work on unconscious bias. Uh, we also do work in um, developing cultural competency and you know, leadership, inclusive leadership, those things as well. All right. Waiting for this poll to come up, just so we can see who we have here. We're up to 117 people joining us. Welcome to those of you who are just coming in. I see the numbers are ticking up as we're going. And the polls ended, so we should see our results in just a moment. This is not exactly Gallup or a scientific survey. We're just 
second to see who's on the call and who's listening. And we see 76% are voting for Hillary Clinton, 8% for Donald Trump, 3% uh, other, 5% unsure, and 5% have decided to sit this one out. So, so I want to talk about a little bit now what we're discovering. There's been a lot of research about how we're interacting with people. And depending upon where you live in the country, or we may actually, I should say, we may have some people who are from uh, out of the country who are, who are listening in as well. But depending upon where you live in the United States, for those of us who are locals, um, you may notice a pattern that's been occurring over the last number of years, and that is people are segregating more politically than ever before. The Cook Political Report started studying this a number of years ago, what they called the Whole Foods Cracker Barrel uh, phenomenon. And that is that they began to notice that people who live around Whole Foods markets, not surprisingly, tend to be more liberal politically than people who live around Cracker Barrel restaurants. And when they started studying this back in 1992, they found that looking at the percentage who voted Democrat, that was just the way they, they chose to do it, there was a 20% gap between the Whole Foods and Cracker Barrel communities. Eight years later, that gap had grown to 32%. Eight years after that, it had grown to 45%. This year, Pew Foundation did a study and found that that gap is now 67%. And so one of the things that's beginning to happen is that we're seg segregating ourselves more and more physically from people who are different from us politically. And one of the net results of that is um, a sense of not understanding the world of the people who are not with us. Now, this election, of course, has brought up that tension, that difference, more than many. So I thought we would just check in real quickly. And, and for this one, what we'll do is we'll just ask you to make a mark next to um, which of these three are correct for you. Do you feel more or less stressed about this election than elections in the past? And Helen, could you instruct people how to do this, please? Sure, of course. So in the top left corner of your screen, right under the words that says Event Info, you should see a little marker button. Click on that to activate your annotation tools. You can use any of the annotation tools to mark whether you're more stressed, less stressed, or no different than the past. Well, we seem to have a clear winner here. <laughs> we all see them popping up. I don't know if that person was voting no different from the past who said, are you kidding, and just crossed it out. <laughs> you don't actually need to write it out. You can just put a colored mark next to it. But, uh, yeah, so we can see overwhelmingly, I think we've seen enough to get the point that overwhelmingly, um, this election has created more stress than elections in the past. And I think that stress can come from many different places. Um, uh, it can come from the fact that we're worried about the results, or it could come from the fact that um, the stress of having people in our lives who are different from us in this regard and the tension that creates. So let's look a little bit at that. Another question. And for this one, we'll do a similar thing, but we'll put the check mark on the left or the right. Left if the answer is yes. Have you found yourself saying or doing something that was out of character for you because of the stress associated with this election? I know for myself, I got, you know, I mean, I get it. I'm hooked into this as much as anybody else, and there have been times when in the process of getting in political conversations, I've, you know, let it get the best of me and had to apologize afterwards. But, uh, um, uh, but you know, this happens sometimes. So we can see most people here are on the right side. So they haven't necessarily said anything that's particularly out of character. We do have a few. Good, so great, so we get a good sense of what's going on here. Most people are saying that's good, that's good that we've maintained ourselves. Well, if, if the stress has been getting to you, you're not the only one. Uh, nine out of 10, this is from a study that was uh, recently published in Harvard Business Review just a couple of weeks ago. Nine out of 10 potential voters say that these elections are more polarizing and more controversial than in the past. 81% that they say that they avoid political discussions at all costs. And when asked to describe voters who support a candidate they oppose, the most common adjectives used were angry, uneducated, ignorant, uninformed, racist, white, narrow, and blind. Now, that's pretty striking, not having a different view of life, not believing in a different political philosophy, but we can see these are very personal comments. And we're going to break that down a little bit as we talk about this. 
We can also see a really interesting pattern that the American Psychological Association found in studying this, and that is the stress across these generations is somewhat an anomaly in that usually stress grows as people get older. Younger people are usually less stressed about elections than older people. But as we can see here, there's a particular pattern among millennials that's quite striking in that millennials are almost the same as people in what they call the mature age group. Um, uh, and, and that's, of course, we see that if, you, if you're somebody who watches the polls and watches the news about this, you see there's been a huge flux in the millennial vote. It's, it's rising and falling, um, sometimes quite dramatically within a short period of time. Another thing that they found was that 52% of people say that it's a very or somewhat significant source of stress in their life. Um, and 59% of Republicans, 55% of Democrats um, are equally likely as one another to say the election is somewhat significantly stressful. And then finally, where social media is concerned, uh, we can see that people who, who use social media tend to have a higher percentage of stress than people who don't use social media. So we're constantly fed by this dialogue going back and forth, sometimes debate, sometimes insulting comments or trolling going on. Um, and this also affect, uh, impacts the level of stress that we end up feeling. Now one of the things I was, I was, when I was watching one of the news shows the other morning, they were talking about the number of people who have had um, a serious clash with somebody who's an important relationship with them, their um, parents, their friends, um, long-time uh, co-workers or some, somebody. And serious clash doesn't mean the relationship ended, but something that created tension or, um, or upset in the relationship. So once again, let's vote. Have you had a serious clash with an important relationship in your life as a result of this election? You can see there's, there's plenty of activity on both sides of this equation. But this is, pretty, this is pretty important. You know, when we begin to look at politics and it begins to take and it have an impact on us uh, more strongly uh, than even our relationships, that it affects the quality of our relationships. And I'm not just talking about a spirited debate one night, of course, but when we begin to feel like, you know, we can, you and I just can't talk about this, that ends up being a real problem uh, through various aspects of our lives. 52% of people in a study that was just released by SHRM um, have said that there are greater political tensions in the workplace now than, than before. Only 44% say about the same, and only 4% say less than previous. So we have another pattern here. So we've got all of these patterns that are coming up, and, and all of these things affect our organizations. People come in with this tension. When you know somebody you're working with is from that other side, whichever that other side is, um, when you have a sense that uh, you're upset or worried about this, uh, we have people certainly who are political activists who work with us who may be going out and doing things. It can create elevate, elevated levels of stress for employees, poor talent management decisions, poor customer service, missed business opportunities, reduced income. So we're going to do another poll around this and ask you to take a, take a, a look at these and identify the ones that, um, that uh, you've begun to see or feel yourself? You know, have you seen people seeming, you know, tense with each other or higher levels of conflict? Have you seen people beginning to affect people's behavior? And of course, we can look at this stress more broadly than just the election. We can also look at it relative to the concern we have about terrorism, concerns we have about the economy and the like. So just uh, vote real quickly and see which of these uh, resonates most with you. Now, Helen, can people vote for more than one here or just one? Mm, just one here. Okay, so choose the one that's the most prevalent for you. You know, in this case, we're actually voting on the right side, folks. We're not checking off this one. Although, if you have more than one, feel free to go ahead and check an additional one on the left. Or you can maybe do it both ways. Higher levels of conflict are showing up a lot. Poor talent management decisions. I did uh, read an article yesterday about uh, somebody who, a senior person in an organization demanded that a lower level person be fired because he was supporting one candidate and she was supporting another one and they had to remind him that that wasn't a cause for firing people. Um, these tensions run very, very high. So the polls ended, so we'll see the results here. Hmm. 
Okay. Um, it's taking a little bit, so I actually have uh, elevated levels of stress for employees. I would think, oh, yeah, almost yeah. 90% <laughs> elevated levels of stress. That's no surprise. And we can certainly see that also in the ones on the left-hand side. And, of course, we know that when people have elevated levels of stress, it also leads to poor talent management decisions, customer service, business opportunities, and reduced income. So even though we, these may not be directly, all of these are deeply affected by the ones that are up here. So, so this is something that's going on around us all the time. So yes, I think it's fair to say that, that from a quantifiable standpoint, not just here, but through the research we're seeing, um, that it is worse than usual. And the question we might ask ourselves is why? So I want to spend some time now talking a little bit about what we're learning about the way we vote, about the decisions we make relative to uh, politics at two elections, because we're learning an extraordinary amount of this, um, and even what the neuroscience behind it is. So let's talk first, philosophically, about how do we make decisions? Because we live in a myth of rationality. Uh, it goes back 2,500 years ago in the Western world of Plato. A lot of you remember from Philosophy 101, Plato was one of the first people who talked about how the mind decides, um, and in his model, um, he, he used the model of a charioteer with two horses. He said the charioteer was like what represented reason, and the horses were the feelings of desires, and uh, feelings and desires or emotions that we have. In his in his in his um, Phaedrus dialogues, Plato talked about this. He said the philosopher kings were the ones who relied on reason. We didn't allow our passions to rule us, and for 2,500 years we've worshipped at the altar of rationality. But in fact, we now know that that's a false assumption, that it's a myth, um, that we're not nearly as rational as we think. So I want to just uh, reference uh, this book, uh, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. It's one of the most brilliant books on politics and, um, and religion and discord in society that I think has, has been written in the last 20 years. Uh, John Haidt is a social psychologist and professor of ethical leadership at, at the Stern School of Business in, at NYU. And his specialty is moral psychology. And Haidt argues that for the most part, moral reasoning is a post hoc affair, and that is we decide what's right or wrong based on the gut feelings that we have about it, what gets triggered by us emotionally, and then only if necessary, um, and then we make up reasons to explain and justify our judgments. Now, some of you know that because you've seen other people do it. They believe in a particular candidate, they like that particular candidate, and they grab seemingly um, seemingly insignificant or not even valid reasons to justify um, that position. It's almost like, let me grab something to prove my point. Of course, we don't see it so clearly when we do it ourselves, but, if, but we're all doing this. Now, now, this ties right back into what we know about the way we think, that we know we have this fast brain a capability that lives in, a lim in the limbic system, that green area you see, and um, occasionally we um, we drift out to our prefrontal cortex, to the red area, our slower brain, where we can make a little bit more thoughtful decisions. But when we see that person or circumstance out there, let's say you're watching the debate and you see a particular candidate in the debate, we have a visceral response that we can now measure looking at fMRIs, functional magnetic resonating imagery, and we can see that the fast brain responds first, that the emotional brain responds first. It's only after that that the slow brain comes in and says, yeah, well, the reason I was upset, the reason I was happy, the reason I didn't like them or the reason I did like them was for these reasons. And this is really important for us to know, not only in decision-making around politics, of course, but in other things as well. Height uses the metaphor of an elephant rider and the elephant, that there's this huge elephant, and the elephant rider really can't control the elephant. He may be able to nudge the elephant to affect it in the right circumstances, but we also know what happens when the elephant gets with a herd of elephants. If an elephant rider is in a stampeding herd of elephants on their elephant, they have almost no control. The elephant will go with the herd. And we're going to be talking in just a little bit about how the herd mentality also affects us. But before that, just as an example of the way our rational minds um, do or don't work around this, I want to use marriage equality, which although we know it's now the law of the land, was, of course, contentious for many years, but it's, it's such a great example of how this works. If we look at marriage equality um, and the resistance to marriage equality, there were really four major areas of resistance. The first was, or contention, first was marriage is for procreation. The second was that it was a violation of people's religious beliefs. The third 
was what was the big deal? Civil unions are really the same thing. And the fourth was that it would devalue the family. But in fact, when we look at each of these things, we find that the, the behind that is questionable rationality. Marriage is procreation, for example, but when my mother remarried at the age of 73, she wasn't planning on procreating, but I don't remember anybody having a problem with it. Um, we say that it's a violation of religious beliefs, and usually people cite Leviticus uh, 12 to 17 and say, man shall not lie lying of a woman. But of course, there are dozens and dozens of passages of the Bible that people ignore. Um, Numbers 14 through 16, I think, believe says that you can you can enslave your neighbor. Um, there are things, uh, passages in the Bible about what you should and shouldn't wear, and yet we, we generally tend to selectively choose those ones we follow. Uh, it, although it says that we will do devalue family, the American uh, Pediatric, Pediatric Association says that actually the healthiest families to live in in the United States are families with lesbian parents. And uh, that even though civil union may seem the same thing, there were actually more than 1,200 civil citations in which it was different. So what is it really about marriage equality then? And for many people, it was this, what I call the yuck factor. And that is, it just made me feel uncomfortable. It, it brought up feelings in me. Well, Height really points to how this happened. In Height's model, he's identified six pillars um, that we use for our psychological basis of morality. The first is, is this thing causing harm or pain? In other words, we make a determination as to whether or not uh, we want this thing to be allowed to happen because it's causing harm or pain. Um, is it fair? Is there equity in the circumstance? Um, how does it tap into our group loyalty? Uh, uh, what's our relationship with hierarchy? What he calls purity and sanctity, and that is what are the things that feel um, at our core like just the right things to do? For example, things that, that, things that aren't accurate would disgust people. Um, he, they do experiments, for example, moral experiments where they'll say to somebody, um, imagine that there's a brother and sister and uh, they're traveling together and um, they're of age and they determine that as an experiment, they're very close, they'd like to have sex with each other and so they, um, they use appropriate birth control, uh, he wears a condom and the like, and nobody will ever know about this other than the two of them. They'll do it one time and just to see what it's like and that's the end of it. Now, would that offend us? Uh, now, people will have very different reactions to that, of course. Uh, some will say, of course, it's just wrong, and that's where there's a strong sense of purity or sanctity. And others will say, oh, no harm, no foul. Nobody will know about it. It's up between the two of them. They're consenting adults, and there's no, sense, no issue of health because they're using birth control, so no big deal. One of the things that, that Height emphasizes is that we can have purity, but it can be very different for different people. So, for example, um, people in the, uh, in the conservative right may have a purity issue around sexual orientation and around marriage between people of the same gender, that may offend their moral code, whereas people on the left may have similarly strong reactions and similar senses of purity about things like the environment or eating organic or things like that. So it's not so much the content, but more our orientation towards these things. And then the last one is our, um, our relationship to the whole notion of liberty and oppression. Now here's where it gets interesting. When you look at these six determinations, and, and when they begin to study them relative, thinking about this like the, um, an equalizer board on a, for a stereo, what they find is that liberals tend to have a very high degree of attention to making sure people aren't harmed, making sure things are fair, and making sure that people are free, and much less concerned about group loyalty, hierarchy, and purity and sanctity. So, you know, something's disgusting, it doesn't necessarily weigh on me so much. If something violates a particular moral code, maybe not weigh on me so much. But if something's going to hurt somebody or if it seems unfair, that's a real problem. And um, certainly if people's freedom is contained. On the other hand, conservatives have a very different configuration. If we look at this next slide, and that is there's almost a balance at a lower level for the higher ones and at a higher level for the lower ones, but they seem to have a, uh, more attention on all of these. Now, the other thing to understand is how these equate may be different. So for example, in um, where fairness and equity is concerned, liberals tend to think of fairness and equity relative to equality, and that is everybody should have similar things available to them. Conservatives tend to look at fairness and equity 
by proportionality. In other words, well, it's not fair for that person to make as much as this person because this person works harder or this person creates jobs or this person. And so we can see both are interested in fairness but from a different standpoint. Liberals may look at liberty and say, I really want liberty. I want people to be free um, and unrestrained by certain things. Um, but uh, conservatives at the same time might want liberty, but the thing that they want to unrestrain from might be the government. So, so we each have these moral codes that are driving us. Now, this is so important to understand. I once heard somebody say that every villain is a hero in their own story. Uh, but the reality is we each have our moral code that we're coming from. And the problem is, getting back to our early conversation about how segregated we are, is that when we're not engaging with each other, when we don't understand where that's coming from, um, that creates a real problem because we're making assumptions that if you don't agree with me, you don't believe in fairness or you don't believe in liberty. You don't believe in avoiding pain. For, for people in, um, who are conservative, when we look at the, this scale here, you can see that because group loyalty is so high, the notion of protecting America is more important perhaps than, or, or it's worth having some people be uncomfortable or having a painful experience. Whereas for liberals, given that harm and pain is so high and loyalty is much lower, going back for a moment to the slide before, um, you can see that if, we, if loyalty is way down here then, um, and harm and pain is up here, then I'm willing to take a risk on loyalty uh, in order to make sure people are safe. So we can see that when we begin to study this in ourselves, uh, we can begin to understand where we're making some of these decisions from. And there are very different ways that liberals and conservatives see the world. And Michael Dodd and John Hibbing at the University of Nebraska found, for example, that when viewing photographs, conservative eyes unconsciously tend to linger longer on unpleasant images, which suggests that conservatives are more attuned than liberals to evaluating potential threats. Now, this is not inconsistent with some researchers who found that it looks like the amygdala, the fear center of the brain, is, tends to be more charged for people with conservative orientation. And by the way, that means not just conservative politics, although it tends to overlap with that, but also a more conservative orientation to life, a, a tendency to be a little bit more hesitant about trying new things, that sort of thing. Um, John Jost at NYU found that conservative students have more cleaning and organizational items, including a stronger orientation towards self-discipline and structure, whereas liberals tend to have more books and travel-related travel -related items and are more oriented towards less restriction and more novelty seeking. So again, we see this sense of containing, being safe on one side, keeping things stable on the other side, trying new things, different things. Now we can see that either one of these things can be valuable at certain times and essential at certain times. And and can also be dangerous if they're extreme. Um, too much orientation, too much discipline and structure obviously makes for a very limiting worldview. Um, too little restriction and just throwing everything up against the wall and seeming sick sometimes does not lead to a very effective or productive life. And so as we separate even more and more, and we'll talk a little bit about the polarity in just a moment, we can see that this, can, this creates potentially a real problem for um, for us in, in understanding each other, what we're coming from, and coming to any common sense of policy. Just to give uh, one of the examples um, from some of the studies that Height and others have worked on, 8,000 people were presented with a series of hypothetical actions. That is, you could kick a, kick a dog in the head, throw away ballots to help your candidate win, publicly bet against your favorite sports team, curse your parents to their face, receive a blood transfusion from a child molester, and they were asked whether they would do these things for money and how much. Liberals were reluctant to harm living things, even for a million dollars, but were willing to betray group loyalty or do something disgusting or disrespect authority. Conservatives were less willing to compromise on those moral issues. So, um, so we're, we have different levels of attachment to that which we consider to be right and different levels, different visceral, visceral emotional levels um, to reaction as well. By the way, just a reminder that if you have questions, um, please feel free to type them in in the box on the right-hand side, and uh, I'll, I'll try to pick some of them up as we go through the, through, through the conversation. So all these being said, there are a number of factors that impact our belief systems. One, as I said before, um, is some indication is biology, that there are certain people who are just biologically oriented more um, towards stress and, and fear and concern. They have more sensitive amygdalas, and, and most of us know people, or may even be one of those people ourselves, who just know that we're a little bit more fearful than some of our friends. We get a little bit more nervous. There's nothing wrong with this. In fact, um, people who are highly sensitized like that can often be 
very keen observers about what's going on around them. They can identify problems and challenges more quickly and therefore be prepared to handle them. Um, they can be more sensitive to a lot of factors that others may blindly miss. On the other hand, um, some people have more productive uh, empathy centers in the brain. They're actually located in the prefrontal, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the premotor cortex, just behind the prefrontal cortex of the brain, where we produce mirror neurons. And we know that certain people um, have more or less of those. For example, we know that people with Asperger's and, and um, autism tend to produce fewer mirror neurons, which is one of the reasons if you've ever been with an Asperger's child at a birthday party, you notice that they're, they're often huddling in the corner or not very comfortable with large groups. It's because they can't read what's going on as easily. So these things can contribute to our various belief systems. If I'm somebody who's highly fearful, I'm probably going to be oriented more to a philosophy that's more controlling. If I'm somebody who's highly empathetic, I'm going to be oriented towards a philosophy that's more caring. So all of these things can, can be factors there. Another are our emotional reactions. We know that we have emotional reactions that are triggered by any number of things. When we watch, for example, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, they may remind us of certain people. Their energy may remind us of something. Uh, we may have a visceral reaction to the way they talk or the way they present themselves or the way they look, their facial expressions, even the way they dress. All of these things can cause emotional reactions. Of course, there's been a lot of talk in this campaign about gender and how gender may show up and whether, for example, um, uh, Secretary Clinton um, is seen differently when she expresses her emotion than, than, uh, than if she were a man. I'm just noticing that uh, somebody questioned, are these going to be available as a recording? Yes, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the website after we're done. So we're reacting to all of these things. Now, where gender is concerned, for example, we know um, a study at the Veterans Administration Hospital found that when doctors uh, went into to coding situations, emergency room situations where a patient was coding, and, and anybody who watches ER knows that the doctor takes over in a circumstance like that, tells people very quickly what to do. When that doctor is a man, um, no problem. They feel good about themselves. They get patted on the back for it. When, the, when a female doctor does the exact same thing, not only are they criticized, in fact, the study, believe it or not, the academic name of this study um, was called Witchy with a B. Um, and you can look that up on the, uh, on the internet. You can see the study yourself if you'd like. Uh, when, so women not only are criticized for it, but they actually go around and apologize for their behavior afterwards. So when, when we know that there are these different perceptions based on gender or race or other factors, that gets projected onto the candidates. If I feel like women shouldn't be angry and if I see, see Secretary Clinton getting angry, um, then that unconscious belief that women shouldn't act like that projects onto, onto her. If I feel like people shouldn't be, be you know, speaking too strongly or shouting or interrupting people and I see, you know, uh, Mr. Trump doing those things, then I react similarly to that. A third category is, of course, the biases that we have. And we know that there are many biases that affect the way we choose our presidents, not just the obvious ones. For example, in the past 70 years, there have only been two presidential elections in which the shorter candidate won. The last man um, elected president whose height was below average was William McKinley, and he was ridiculed as a little boy. Since 1900, a taller candidate has won 70% of the time. Now, one would say that, uh, you know, an actuary or somebody who really, or a demographer, somebody who really studies statistics would say that that's pretty significant. And yet, how many of us heard anything about the fact that President Obama was five inches taller when he ran against Senator McKay back in 2008? You know, I don't recall seeing it seen anywhere. Um, and yet the, the data would see, certainly indicate that we have various different uh, reactions to that and could very much be an influencing factor. So we're influenced by things like that, by appearance, by height, by the language that people use, um, even by the topics that they, ter they talk about or the way they talk about those topics as well. We're also impacted pretty dramatically by group pressure. And this is something that I know many people have talked to me about. Uh, People who say, you know, I actually support one candidate, but I'm afraid to say it with my friends, or I'm afraid to say it at work, I'm afraid to say it with my family, I'm afraid to talk about this because I may be rejected by the group. And, and in fact, we know, we know that this is true. So the question we might ask ourselves is why are we so willing to go along with the mob? Well, some of, the, some of you who have been with me before know that this is a, this is a particular uh, subject of interest of mine. Um, the whole notion of belonging is something that I'm um, I'm really passionately interested in, as a matter of fact, I'm beginning to do research for a new book on the subject. 
because what we've learned over a course of the last 10, 15, 20 years is that we have a much deeper need to belong, to fit in and connect with the groups that we associate with than ever before. Um, most of us remember Maslow's hierarchy from Philosophy 101. Abraham Maslow created this model in 1943. And in Maslow's model, uh, we start down here with physiology. Um, we need to first handle physiology, then safety, then belongingness, then self-esteem, and finally self-actualization. In other words, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna worry so much about contemplating life until you know where dinner is coming from. And this has been a model that has been incredibly powerful in American psychology, one of the most powerful models in the last 70 years. But what we're realizing now through the neuroscience is that Maslow may in fact have been wrong, that belongingness may in fact be our most important human need. And this is not surprising when you think about it. Uh, the most vulnerable time of a human being's existence is infancy. And uh, infants can't get their physiological needs met unless they belong to somebody, whether it's mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, or the orphanage, somebody has to be there to feed them. So the first imprint that we have in our life is I exist because you exist. And that need to fit in is, in, is incredibly strong. If you can look for yourself, I can give you a very simple, a little off color, but very simple example of how our need to belong can sometimes supersede our physiological needs. I'm sure almost everybody, if not everybody, who's participating with us today has been in a situation where you were in a meeting and you needed to go to the restroom. And rather than just jump, just jump up and go to the restroom, what you did instead was sit there and squirm for a while because you didn't want to be the first one in the group to leave to go to the restroom. You didn't want to be the outsider in the group by doing that. Then as soon as one person goes, all of a sudden this huge sense of relief occurs and in the next 15 minutes, most of the group leaves and comes and goes to the restroom. So this need to, to belong is really powerful for us. And in fact, what the neuroscience research is showing is that being excluded from a group triggers activity in the same regions of the brain associated with physical pain. And that's hugely important for us to understand. This is why bullying, why being an outsider is so isolating, why it's so hard for us to maintain our point of view about something when we're with a crowd that feels the other way. Now, this, none of this is to say that nobody can violate these, quote, rules. It's just talking about general patterns of human behavior. So we're gonna to try to show you a little video that sort of characterizes how people come across believing, doing the kinds of things they do. And let, let's see if this video works for us, Alan. Sure, so the sound on this video is going to be coming out of your computer speaker, so make sure you've got that turned up. It is not going to t come through your telephone, so turn up your computer speakers to hear the audio on this video. And when you're done watching the video, go ahead and give us a green check mark. The green check mark is located right below the participant list. Um, there's a little bubble with a check mark in it. Just click on the drop down and find yes.
Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, I'm sorry the video is a little slow at first, but I think you got the point. This is an interesting phenomenon that's been, you know, scientists have been studying for years. I'm sorry that you didn't see, some of you didn't see the video, but what happened was just very quickly is that they showed a woman sitting in a, um, a waiting room of a doctor's office and uh, she was the only test subject in the initial video. Everybody else sitting in the waiting room with her was told to stand when there was a beep. And it took only three beeps before she started to stand with everybody else. Then one by one they removed the other people until she was there by, by herself and she still stood when it beeped. And then as new people came in, it showed how they each went, started to stand with her until a whole room of people, none of whom had been in the original group, were now standing with the beep. Why? Because that's the way we do things around here. Now some of you have seen this happen in your organizations. You have a particular way of doing things and somebody comes in with a new idea. Let's say, you know, meeting times. You know, there are many different organizations that have their own sort of time zone, if we will. A nine o'clock meeting may start at 9.10 or 9.15. And somebody comes, let's say, the first day, and there's somebody who came from a more rigid culture or a more you know, on-time culture, I shouldn't say rigid, I don't mean that to be a judgment, um, a, more, a, a more disciplined culture around time. And, uh, and the first day they show up at the meeting at 9 o'clock, but nobody else shows up until 9, 10, or 9, 15. How many days is it before they also start to stagger in a little bit later? And so this notion of group pressure in our belief systems is a really important one. It starts with our families and goes to our communities, the people we hang out with, the people we work with. Um, and we'll see how this is really being influenced in just a moment. We also have our historic political identities that we have, um, personal interest about particular subjects. So for some people, some people, for example, are single subject voters. They will determine a, who they vote for based on how that, preserve, that person uh, feels about partic one particular issue. Um, exposure, how much are we exposed to? And finally, our own personal identities um, and how those identities play out. So let's look at what we're seeing and how this happens. I mean, if we go back to the time that certainly I grew up, we know we all used to watch the same television stations. You know, there was ABC, NBC, and CBS, and really nothing else. And there was also very little interpretation on the news in those days. It was considered to be unethical for a news reporter to let you know what their politics were or which, or which people they, um, uh, they supported. And so you almost never knew. Editorials were at the end of the at the end of the news broadcast, some of us who are old enough to remember, remember there would be always a guy with this white shirt and tie who would come on and say, this is an editorial. But aside from that, there was almost no punditry. And so we got our news from these common sources, and then we interpreted those that news based, based on our own particular points of view. Now that's changed quite dramatically. Now we each watch different news sources. And we get pre-interpreted news because a large percentage of what's on those news sources is opinion and punditry. You look at CNN, for example, this year, who has on their staff actually paid Donna Brazil, who is the chair of the Democratic Party, and Corazon Lewandowski, who is the former head of, of uh, Donald Trump's campaign. And so these are actually paid reporters now on CBS or paid pundits on CBS. And so it gets reinforced so that we're hearing all of the same thing and of course gets reinforced not just from that but from other sources as well. So I want to share with you just this little article that was in the Washington Post. Once upon a time, Diane Belson would get up in the morning and read the paper, take in news stories about candidates and campaigns. Some stuff she agreed with and some stuff she didn't. This morning, Belson wakes, makes coffee and settles in at her desktop to fire up Facebook. There are news feed are more than 100 stories and some of her 460 friends have posted since she went to bed eight hours ago. Over the next three hours, she bops around the web checking out the latest campaign news. Her sources are big and small, from nearby to far away, but they have one thing in common, with very rare exceptions, the news and commentary sites she visits share her worldview. This is true for many of us. You know, we, we have our, the TV show we watch, we have a particular radio show we might listen to, um, we have our Facebook feed, uh, our, um, the newspaper, particularly the newspaper we read, uh, Twitter, uh, any the blogs that we read, um, the people we talk to and live around as we saw earlier. And so we're living in these echo chambers and these echo chambers are incredibly, incredibly pervasive. And when we only watch one, one news, for example, we don't even realize how that's, how that's limiting us. Uh, when I did the research for my second book, Everyday Bias, I actually did a section on how we elect politicians and it really has changed the way I watch the news. I now watch 
we now watch in our in our home multiple news stations when there's a, especially when there's a big event around and and it's extraordinary to see um, how uh, it's demonstrated, for example, a few couple of months ago, if you remember the, when uh, Congressman Lewis led the sit-in, Democratic Congress people led a sit-in um, on House of Representatives to get a vote on a particular gun control measure that was up. Uh, we switched that night and we were flipping between uh, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox, and we started with watching CNN. And, uh, and I would say about 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of the coverage was about the incident was going on, and occasionally they would zip off and take another story and then come back to it. Then we flipped to, flipped to MSNBC and it was 100%, uh, Rachel Maddow was on it, it was 100% covering that story and she was talking with people right on the house floor using Facebook, I mean FaceTime and, um, and Periscope and the like. And then we flipped to Fox, Fox News and there was no mention of the incident at all in the 30 minutes we watched. We watched 30 minutes in each station. Now, just to be clear, I've seen the same thing happen in reverse where a story is, is emphasized or de-emphasized in one station and the exact opposite happens uh, somewhere else. So this is what we tend to do. And if we're in this echo chamber, um, and, and uh, Joe Schapter just uh, posted, it's interesting to think how best to break out of our own echo chambers. We'll be talking about that, Joe, in just a little bit. Um, but if we are in that echo chamber, at some point we begin to believe not that this is a point of view, but that this is truth. And this is the point I want to really emphasize through this whole talk, is that there's nothing wrong with having a strong point of view. There's nothing wrong with strenuously arguing your point of view. Um, as long as two things are true. One thing is, as long as we know that our point of view is a point of view. And secondly, as long as we're in conversations with people who also um, enjoy or get value out of the nature of the way we're discussing it. I happen to grow up in a home in which debating was encouraged and it was seen as a, an active um, intellectual exercise. And so I like a good strong debate and I like a good strong opponent in a debate who can give it back to me as good as I can get. Um, and I almost never will take it personally. On the other hand, I know people who are very sensitive to that. So we have to, we have to be sure we're matching the people we're talking to. So let's take a minute and see. And once again, if you can, and, and why don't we do it this, this way. We'll, we'll use the left-hand side just because it'll be quicker. But just when you make your mark, just put a, um, if you just like put a spot like that, as opposed to a big check mark, that way we'll be able to see more. Where do you get most of your political information from? So take your pen and, and mark it on the left, and let's see where most people draw from. And it's fine to do more than, you know, maybe put your top two choices so we can get a sense. I mean, obviously all of us may get them from a lot, but take a look and see. So heavy emphasis on television, heavy emphasis on social media, but uh, certainly significant on internet, and newspapers, and radio as well. So we're getting it from lots and lots of different places. Now the question to ask yourself is, you know, what kind of diversity is there in that language? And by the way, when I talk about watching other stations, I'm not talking about them so that you can poke fun and ridicule, even though it is hard sometimes. There's no question when you're watching that other station, whichever one it is for you, um, that it will trigger you at times and you'll feel um, angry or annoyed or the like. But, but can we also watch that with, from the standpoint of trying to understand those various points of view? Okay, we'll keep moving here. Now, one of the things that's happened over the last 40 or 50 years in our country is a shift in the fundamental way we look at politics. If we go back to 1972, this is based on Pew research, we can see a particular pattern here that I have these red lines marking Republicans, blue lines marking Democrats, and that is that most Republicans were more on the conservative side of the spectrum, but you had the, for example, the Northeastern liberal, but what we used to call the Rockefeller Republicans on the left. People you know, like uh, Nelson Rockefeller or Jacob Javits or um, people like that who were um, uh, uh, Margaret Chase Smith from Maine who were Republicans but were very liberal in social issues, especially civil rights, very supportive of those kinds of things. Um, but more conservative, let's say, on financial issues or on um, national defense. You also had people, Democrats, who were very conservative, for example, the Southern Democrats who were very conservative on social issues, particularly civil rights. Um, but might be more liberal on other issues. You had, during the Vietnam War days, the Scoop Jackson Democrats who were pro-war and the Mark Hatfield Republicans who were anti-war. And what this created was this bell curve that we see here in which most people were in the center area and 
in which there was a lot of room for compromise. You know, we, even though we're from different parties, we share, we share similar views on this particular issue, or on this particular issue, or on this particular issue. Now what we have is a very different structure. We've gone from that bell curve to what I sometimes refer to more as a dumbbell curve. And that is that everything is on the extremes, or much more is on the extremes, and far fewer people in the central area where the most, the most liberal Republican is more conservative than the most conservative Democrat. And this leaves very little space here for compromise because we're no longer in situations where our, um, our tendency to want to, to be solution-oriented overwhelms our identity. And what happens, the, the other thing is that this, is also, this has also been influenced by a change in practice among congressional leaders, which started really in 1994 when Newt Gingrich, when he was a Speaker of the House, decided that it was, it was really better for Republicans in the House, and it went on to infuse into the Senate to some degree too, to spend more time in their local districts, building relationships in local districts. And so they changed the way of operating from being in town in D.C. most of the time to going home every now and again. To, to having the, uh, the Congress meet from Tuesday morning till Thursday evening and then being home for the weekends. Well, this fundamentally and pretty radically changed the relationship between legislators in our country. It used to be that legislators would be in town. Their social system would be with other legislators. Famously, people like Orrin Hatch, the uh, um, conservative senator from Utah, and Teddy Kennedy, the obviously liberal senator from Massachusetts, were very dear friends. People would share homes with people from the other party. Uh, that was not unusual for Congress people or senators to have a group house that they would live in with two or three other um, colleagues, sometimes from other parties. And so people were together a lot. They had personal relationships. They had um, almost family relationships, even if they had different political leanings. Now, of course, we see the opposite. Now people stay in town for such a short period of time and are working for most of it, and so as a result of that, they don't have these social relationships. And what we know from the research is that when people are asked to address a problem together, they tend to move towards moderation. So if you put a group of conservatives and liberals in a room and lock them in that room and say, I want you to come up with a solution about something, they will tend to move towards moderation. They'll tend to try to look most times, and I'm talking about most people here, obviously, will tend to look towards what possible compromise there is. But if you separate people and you have them look at those problems separately, the exact opposite happens. They tend to move towards the extremes. And this we can see happening right in front of our eyes, that if all Democrats talk about something and all Republicans talk about something, the stronger, more, um, we might say more orthodox elements of both of those parties will, will, be, will be more dominant in those conversations than when we're moving towards um, towards some kind of a joint solution. And at those times, we tend to gravitate towards confirmational thought rather than exploratory thought. So then we do, when we even meet somebody, uh, instead of saying, wow, let me understand what you're saying, what, we, what we're listening for is how can I prove you wrong? How can I prove myself right? And that kind of listening obviously rarely leads to to any kind of a constructive dialogue. Now, as we're talking about this, I really invite all of us, including myself, to look at this. Because you know, one of the things I've been reflecting a lot on during this campaign, because I've been strongly involved, is you know, all the times when I allow uh, myself to get triggered, or allow myself to get reactive rather than to be really listening, the times when I was trying to prove my point rather than exploring the other, the other point of view. And, it, and it's so important that we do that, not only in politics, but in life in general. We also notice that these Visceral beliefs that we have, the stronger they are, they more affect us. So and there's a little text here, but I want I, the study is so fascinating, it's worth seeing. This uh, Dale, Daniel Cahan, who's at uh, Yale University, gave more than 1,000 participants a tricky math problem to compute, and it was framed as a question around the effectiveness of laws against concealed handguns, which is obviously a highly political and emotional issue. So in other words, you had to do this computation in order to prove a point around these issues. Um, what they found was that conservative Republicans were much less likely to correctly interpret the data um, when it suggested that a gun ban decreased crime in the city, and for liberal Democrats, the exact opposite was true. Um, uh, in, other words, in other words, as soon as it came to proving their point, they lost their ability to do basic mathematics. We're so viscerally oriented towards our point of view and proving ourselves right that we forget how to count. And interestingly enough, people who were normally best at mathematical reasoning were the most susceptible to getting the political charge question wrong. 
it's almost because it feels almost like that if I know that I can count on myself to do this, usually, uh, then um, then I don't think carefully about what I'm doing. I allow my emotions to get the best of me. Now, my guess is that every one of you has heard somebody or seen somebody, whether it's somebody you know or one of the political surrogates on TV uh, for either candidate, who so easily cast out information and data and ignore it, downplay it, or it misinterpret it because it doesn't assure their point of view. It doesn't reinforce their point of view. And once again, it's not just them who does this. This is something that we all do. We also know that these visceral factors show up in some fascinating ways. Now, Alexander Todorov, who's, who's um, he's actually at Princeton now, I believe, but when he was at NYU, um, did this study back in 2004. He uh, they asked people to view photographs of competing pairs of Senate and House candidates before the 2004 elections. But they showed them to them for only one second, and then they were asked after one second to, uh, to rate the confidence and trustworthiness of each candidate. So the picture would show up just like that for one second. And what they found was after one second, the spontaneous ratings predicted the winners 70% of the time. Now think about what that means, that just by looking at people, people could sense who the winner was. Now, that's pretty powerful to think that appearance, um, and we could add some other triggers, you know, particular words that people say or something like that. This is another study that was done at San Diego State and University of Chicago using the implicit association test. Some of you know the implicit association test was created. Uh, it's a research tool that was created by researchers at Harvard, University of Virginia, and University of Washington, and um, is designed to uh, allow us to take, uh, to be more aware of some of our, the unconscious connections we make, positive and negative, with different things. So they did this one first. They said, who's more American? Um, Kate Winslet, the British-born actress on the left, or Lucy Liu, the American-born actress of Asian extraction on the right. Uh, probably doesn't surprise you at all to see the way this turned out, even though Kate Winslet is British and Lucy Liu has been born and has lived in the United States pretty much her whole life. Nonetheless, who looks more American to our unconscious mind. So right before the 2008 election, these researchers decided we'll do the same thing with the presidential candidates. And at that time, they were down to the last three presidential candidates. And here's what they found. Now, obviously, this, this differential was not enough for um, President Obama to, to lose the election, but nonetheless, kind of interesting. And, and not at all um, unconnected to the residents of the birther movement. If, for example, somebody had made a big deal about John McCain not being born in the United States, which he actually wasn't born in the continental United States, although he was in a U.S. protectorate, um, it probably wouldn't have had the same resonance as uh, President Obama because of what we know about his background. In fact, when they just for fun threw in Tony Blair, who was at the time the British Prime Minister, he actually viscerally tested higher than Obama. Pretty crazy, huh? This just shows you, once again, this is the elephant, the elephant and uh, not the rider making these decisions. So we're impacted by our identities quite strongly, these personal identities we have, whether it's our race or gender or other things, and we can actually see how this shows up relative to what's going on in the campaign today. Um, 538.com, which is one of the most um, reputable polling sources, put up these two maps. This is what happens if no white people vote, based on their polling, and this is what happens if only white people vote. These are two Americas we're looking at. Quite extraordinary. This is what happens if only women voted, and this is what happens if just men voted. So identity, our personal identity, is very strongly tied to our political views. Uh, if you're an African-American Republican, for example, or this, this year especially a Latino Republican, you know, if you're a woman who supports uh, Donald Trump, um, all of these times are places where you might feel yourself, feel a tension with you and your identity community, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and of course, all of this feeds into our sense also of stereotyping and, and the, the reactive assumptions we tend to make about certain people and what their belief systems are. But these, def these separations are, are far more dramatic than any we've ever seen in the past. I'll go back to look at it again because they're just so impactful when we look at this. So if we go back to this map, what we can see has happened is that we've gone from this model, which is very much of an issue-driven paradigm. In other words, we decide where we are in the spectrum depending upon the particular issue. I might be progressive on civil rights, but conservative on financial policy. I might be um, 
progressive on uh, a foreign policy issue, but conservative on civil rights, you know, all of these things kind of go back and forth to one that's now an identity-driven paradigm. And this is very, very dangerous to our body politic because when we evaluate people based on issues, it's impersonal. I have to understand why you think that. I may disagree with you, but it's not about you as a human being. It's just I don't agree with you on the issue. When we evaluate people based on identity, we objectify them. And this happens not just about the candidates, but about people who are the supporters of the candidate. And this is a really important distinction, I think, for us to know. And that is um, that we, we know that political candidates, when they choose to run, make a choice to put themselves in front of us to be evaluated, to be judged. That's part of the game, you know. They, they run for office and we judge them. We say we like them or we don't like them, we agree with them or we don't agree with them. But people who support candidates um, are not publicly putting themselves up for that. And, and our tendency, especially now, is not to see the person as somebody who supports that candidate, uh, let's say, you know, Senator Clinton or Secretary Clinton, but to see them as a Clinton supporter. Now, I know that that's a funny distinction. Um, sometimes uh, our friends in the disability community like to make an important distinction between calling people disabled people or people with disabilities. And I know a lot of people hear that as political correctness, but it's actually an important distinction in language. Um, it's, as my dad used to say, uh, the emphasis is on the wrong syllable. So, uh, if you're a person, if you're a, a disabled person, then the emphasis is on your disability. If you're a person with a disability, the emphasis is on your personhood and not the disability. The disability is a part of your personhood. In the same case, if you're somebody, my sister, who's, I'm making this up, you're my brother or my sister and you support, you know, I'm a Clinton supporter and you support Trump, you're my sister who supports Trump. But if I start to see you as a Trump supporter, then along with that comes all of the association, and the same thing is true for Clinton, by the way, I just have to choose one to start with. This, all of the associations we have with that candidate, all the judgments that we have with that candidate, all the beliefs we have about that candidate, and, and all of that then gets laid on you. So I make the assumption, for example, that that means you support everything about this candidate. I make the assumption that you justify everything that this candidate does. And when I do that, it makes it very difficult um, for me to, to um, not have that get in the way of my relationship with you. When we're voting with our identities, we're inherently less able to compromise and will inherently take the campaign and the election more personally, which leads to what we saw earlier, the clash between people stressed. It's one thing to challenge an idea, but it's another thing entirely to feel like your very identity has been challenged. When somebody discounts you, and remember those words we saw earlier, you know, when we looked at that, at that earlier slide, and they described as people were described as angry, uneducated, ignorant, uninformed, racist, white, narrow, and blind. These are not, these are not adjectives describing somebody's political point of view, for the most part. Um, these are adjectives that describe people's personhood. And so this, this tendency is something that focuses exactly on where a lot of this tension, this personal tension comes from. And we would be foolish to think that we leave this, person, this um, stuff at home. Now there's some workplace environments I know um, where it's just considered to be anathema to talk about politics. I was out at the, um, at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs yesterday working with their um, the leaders of, of the academy, and uh, we were talking a bit about how they deal with this, and they were saying it's just considered to be inappropriate because whoever wins is going to be our boss, and we do not want to have that in our space. And so that doesn't mean that they might not have an inclination how some people believe, but they've created an environment that contains that. Now that may be completely appropriate in a highly disciplined environment like the military, a little bit more difficult when we work in our um, offices in much more informal environments where we have a good sense of what people see, think, talk, read, hear, where we walk in and they're listening to one radio station versus another state radio station, or, or we see a bumper sticker on their car in the parking lot. So all of these things, um, all of these things are important factors in knowing how this plays out. Now, why it's really important is because when we begin to objectify, it leads to faster decision making, automatic thinking, and stereotyping. We're much more likely to stereotype and to make very automatic decisions without being thoughtful about them when we're into this objectification mode. Let me show you one policy decision that reflects this. In, 19, in 2009, when the um, health care initiative, what now we know as Obamacare, was, was being debated. Some researchers at Yale did a study where they um, gave 
I forget how many people, I think it was something like 1,400 people. Um, uh, basically synopses of both the Republican health care plan and the Democratic health care plan and asked them to evaluate which one they agreed with. However, before they did, the, before they did it, they switched the names on the plan. So people were actually getting a Democratic health care plan that was titled Republican health care plan or a Republican health care plan that was titled Democratic health care plan. And then they asked people to vote which ones which ones they like best, and 75% of the time, people voted for, chose what they didn't believe in because it had their party's name on it. Now think about the implications of that. What that means is that we're now coming to problems, we're coming to problems with an already determination what we're going to choose because we're identified with the point of view that we think that's coming from. You know, how many people turn on MSNBC if they even turn it on, ready to refute what they hear, or turn on Fox, ready to refute what they hear, because they already have a belief system about what people are going to say. And when we get into this kind of a mindset, it creates this sense of confirmationality rather than inquiry. Instead of trying to understand each other, we're already loaded for bear and ready to fight about our point of view and justify our point of view. And this is really difficult then, it makes it very difficult for us to come together to find collective, collective um, results or, or ways to deal with things because anybody who decides to play around in this middle here is confronted with the awful C word, compromiser, which is more and more seen as invalid um, to people from uh, both sides of the, of the political spectrum. It also leads to us to objectify and dehumanize our candidates. So you see people mudslinging. We start to throw names at people. Now sometimes we may justify these and you know, we consciously do this and, you know, as long as we're doing things consciously, we bear, the, bear the, uh, the brunt of what we've chosen to do, then that's a choice we make. But often we don't even question these things. We see somebody as uh, a misogynist or we see somebody as a, a crony capitalist or a criminal or whatever we see and, and we then gather the data to support that already point of view. And so what we see in this conflict, as the conflict's in front of us, is actually two people coming from two different backgrounds, which give them two different lenses to look at the problem or the, or the situation, and we get triggered by each other in this circumstance. And so as a result, you know, we get into these kind of uh, perpetual cycles, these conflicts of these, these conflict discussions that never seem to end. The only way out of this is to understand our own triggers, to begin to look at our own triggers. Otherwise, this is what our political system looks like. Helen, you can play this video clip. So again, those of you who have video or who has uh, sound, turn up your computer speakers to hear the video. Some of us are old enough to remember this toy, but this is what our political campaigns now look like. All right, and Howard, so it looks like the video has stopped on my side. It's totally fine, thank you. Um, so the question we want to ask ourselves is, is this the world we want to live in? You know, are we really prepared to live in a world in which before the election is even over, we're already deciding what we will do to stop the other person rather than how are we going to work with that person to, to have things work? I mean, some of you saw, I know, it became an internet meme recently, the letter that George H.W. Bush led, left for President Clinton on his desk. If you haven't seen it, I, had I thought about it, I would have put it in this deck just so you could look at it. But it's, it's really very impressive. He, it's a letter that he left on his desk when, when President Clinton came into the White House for the first time as president. And it basically said, um, you know, welcome to this office. It's an office of power. People will be judging you. Um, Stick with it, stick to your guns, take care, you know, do what, do what you think is right, and, you know, I hope you're successful because you're all of our president. Now, it's hard to imagine either one of our candidates today writing that, is it? Um, somebody just uh, sent a note here. Let me see what it says. It says, great suggestion we seeing and referring to those who disagree with as a person who supports candidate X instead of an ex-candidate supporter. It's very important and very distinct language. Um, and also, uh, that's what makes this so scary, people already deciding not to be kind to one another. That's right. So is this the way it has to be? 
You know, does it have to be this way? And I'm going to suggest that there are things that we could do, no matter how strongly we feel about the candidates, no matter how much we dislike that other candidate, there are things that we can do in our relationships with people who support that candidate that can really make a difference. We have a long history, human history, of reaching across boundaries to create reasonable change. Um, in the, the coalitions around the civil rights movement, uh, the uh, peace treaty between Arab and Israel, um, U.S. and Russian accord between Gorbachev and Reagan, the Israeli and Palestinian accord that uh, President Clinton um, uh, facilitated, uh, the Northern Ireland dispute that was ended, the, the peace at the end of the Rwandan dispute, dispute the, the South African, the end of apartheid in South Africa. I mean, these were major, incredibly huge issues. Um, and we were able to, we've been able in many cases to have movement on those. So, you know, how do we begin to heal these divisions? Well, there are a number of things that I'm going to suggest that we can do and that if all of us can take on particular practices that can move us in that direction. Um, before I go there, let's see, that there's a question, why do you think the negativity is so in our face this time around and, and the last time too? Um, I think it's really, um, I think it's really, uh, the reason it's intensifying, as we said before, is because we have less and less contact with the others and because we're being reinforced by a constant barrage of media information that reinforces our point of view and dismisses the other point of view. And so the tendency, unfortunately, um, is to, to live in this echo chamber where um, I don't hear the other, I don't understand the other's point of view, and all I hear is how bad they are and how wrong they are, and here's more and more evidence to it, so it calcifies. Um, our, uh, our, our belief systems. I have a friend who used to call it um, a psychological sclerosis, hardening of the attitudes. Um, so let's, the first thing that we can do, as I said before, is to distinguish between the candidates and their followers. But pay attention to this. Second is um, to start watching and listening to the other media sources. Now, I know there are a lot of people out there, and since we've got since we've got an overwhelming number of Democrats on, on this call, because we did do a poll for those of you who joined us late, I know I'll largely speak to you. A lot of you who say, well, you ain't ever going to get me to watch Fox News. And similarly, there are a lot of Republicans, Republicans who say, you're never going to watch me to get me to watch MSNBC. Um, but this is the problem. And I don't mean watching and listening to other media sources so that you can make fun of them or prove them wrong or anything like that. Um, it's, uh, I'm talking about watching with an intention to understand an intention to really get where are they coming from. I'm just noting there are a couple of comments. I want to catch them before they disappear on my queue here. Uh, it says, uh, somebody said it's, uh, it's all, also the difference between saying person of color or person or people of color versus colored people. There are many who are nervous about using those terms for that reason. That, that's another example of that for sure. Um, a second one is to open a dialogue in a constructive way in your company, your school, your organization, your hospital, or your community. To actually sit down and give people a chance in a safe container to talk about this. And in just a moment, I'm going to show you on our Cook Ross website, we've created a free resource tool um, for inclusive uh, called Inclusive Responses in Times of Fear. Actually, maybe I can just quickly put it up. No, never mind. We'll stay where we are for right now. Um, I'll show you in just a moment. Um, which is we've just designed for free to put out into the community, which actually gives you some guidelines as to how to conduct that conversation in a way that creates a safe container for people to have the conversation. And it might be used even in your own family. The third is to begin to talk to your children about the other point of view. And I know we want to teach our children our moral guidelines, of course. And we, of course, you know, will want to believe that our children will believe what we believe. But we can do that at the same time as teaching them to respect, to respect people who have the other point of view. I'm really stunned how many young people today, how these children today are picking up um, their parents' assessments of, um, of the president, um, of Congress people, of famous people, um, without any sense. I know when I grew up, the, the very strong message was, you respect the office even if you don't like the person. But that's no longer the case anymore to focus on learning about the other rather than changing or fixing the other. And this is also important. Can we have dialogues about how to have those conversations? In just a minute, I'm going to give you a very specific tool for doing that uh, with people. Um, to show respect and honor the relationships at present, to make sure with people, when you're talking with people, that they understand that even though you disagree on this issue, that you still respect them, that you care about them, even love them in some cases, because I was with somebody just 
two weeks ago who was telling me that her marriage has been deeply affected by this because she's on the liberal side and he's on the conservative side. And they have to be really careful what, even not to watch the same news station together. Somebody recommended a great book for children, Old Turtle and the Broken Truth, that lends itself to teaching about and respecting other people's points of view. Thank you so much for that, Coney. I appreciate it. Um, and so, um, so this is really important that we that we make it clear that we value the relationship. And one one big piece of that, of course, is is asking permission before we get into the conversations and saying, look, is this a conversation you'd be interested in having with me? Uh, now, when you're on social media, if somebody comments on something you post, then that's a tacit, you know, they're, they're giving you your opinion, it's a tacit uh, acceptance that, that, you know, they're interested in your opinion. But, but if, you, if you respond to something they post, they, they may or may not be interested in your argument. So it's worth saying, you know, here's my point of view, would you like to discuss this further? Um, this way we just, we, we maintain some body of respect in our conversations. To focus on the common ground, you know, where are the places that we, um, even though we disagree on these issues, what are the things that we agree with? And, and in many cases, we're a lot closer than we think we are on some very important issues, even if we might agree on some that are very important for us as well. And then the last one on this list is uh, to take the other to lunch. And this is a tool that was originally created by Elizabeth Lesser, who's one of the co-founders of the Omega Institute up in Rhinebeck, New York, and I've adapted it slightly. But I think it's an incredibly powerful tool, and it's one that I've actually used, and I'll share an example of, of how I used it as I described the tool so you can get a good sense of it. So the first is very important, and that is to have agreed upon ground rules. In other words, if you do invite somebody to lunch, just saying, look, I know that you support, you know, President, uh, Secretary Clinton and I support uh, Donald Trump. Um, I, I'd love to have a conversation with you with no intention to persuade you, no intention to convince you. I'm not going to, you know, try to defend. I just would really like to understand and really get from your point of view, what you think it is about that candidate and share with you what I think is about my candidate to, to, to win and um, why I want them to win. And, and just beginning with this is so important because you create a container. Now, of course, once you've established these ground rules, you have to be willing to come back to the ground rules and reinforce them. Then, the, then you ask four questions. And when you ask these four questions, it's good to set aside a certain amount of time that each of you have to answer. So if you say, okay, let's take five minutes to answer this first question. You set a timer, one person gets five minutes and the other person gets five minutes. What that does is it prevents one person from dominating energetically the conversation. It, it also helps maintain the discipline of the conversation, which has our minds feel safer. When we know there's a discipline and a structure we're working in, we tend to feel safer and therefore more open. So the example that I'm going to use is um, a few years ago, I was facilitating a diversity workshop for a, a, a group of um, community leaders. And in the course of talking about sexual orientation, one of the people in the workshop, who was a young African-American man, um, said that his, he believed that homosexuality was a sin and because that's what his church taught. And that deeply offended one of the white gay men in the group who left the group and created a huge uproar in the group and a lot of upset. So they asked me if I would facilitate a mediation between these two people. And in fact, I did. I met with both of them. And so the, I'm going to use that as an example of how this worked in their case. So the first question is, what are some of your life experiences that have led you to feel the way you do? And in this case, what happened was the, um, the, the gay man shared his story, as you would think. The African-American man shared his story, which was that he grew up in a community which, very violent community, a lot of his friends died. And, um, and as a result, uh, he knew that the only reason he survived was because he went to church all the time, and so he didn't question anything in his church. The second question, what issues deeply concern you? And this is, this is really the pivot question, when we get people to talk about their fears, because fear is at the basis of all of this. Gandhi said, we think that hatred is the problem, but fear is the problem. Um, when we get people to talk about their fear, we get to the core of where the reactions come from, and that gives us insight into the true nature of who people are. A great famous example of this was when Jimmy Carter um, uh, mediated the, the uh, Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin uh, mediation. He was stuck until he got to a point he asked them, what are your concerns about your grandchildren? And when they started to talk about their grandchildren is when they found common ground. The third, what have you always wanted to ask from someone from the other side? 
And so this gives you a chance to clear all those questions. How do you, why do you do this? Why do you believe that? How do you believe this? And then finally, this uh, additional one I've added is, is there anything you'd like to clean up the past? In other words, you may have said things that were inappropriate. You might have um, questioned somebody in an inappropriate way and you want to apologize for that. So I really advise you try this. Now, not everybody will want to get in these conversations, but look for the people who are more towards a moderate center because that's where we can build a coalition that can start bringing people together. And what are some ways for us to cope personally with our stress around these issues? First of all, to recognize that even if it's more than usual, election stress is normal. There's always some stress around elections. And I know, you know, there's questions about what will happen after this election, but some of, some of the tension, some of the immediacy of this will pass and we'll be able to get back to a more normalized state. If, the, if watching media a lot triggers you, then reduce your media exposure. No, if, you, if you're somebody who gets really agitated by watching a news station um, and seeing some of this stuff reported, then don't watch before you go to sleep at night. Don't take that to bed with you. It will affect your overall health if you can keep yourself a little, a little um, break from that. Avoid conversations that escalate. When you hear a conversation escalating to the point when it gets personal, it's totally appropriate to say, can I press the pause for a minute? This is getting too personal for me. It's not the way I like to talk about politics. I respect you and I don't want to get personal with you, so I'd like to stop now. Now, you might frustrate people because some of us who are debaters, when we get going, we like to continue to talk and we don't like to be shut down, but it's better that than getting to the point where you're shouting names at each other. Recognize that stress and anxiety about, about what might happen is not productive. So, so channel some of your concerns to making a positive difference on issues rather than just complaining about issues. Is there something that you can do to move it forward? Volunteer for your candidate rather than simply um, sit back. One of the feelings that generates stress the most is, help, is hopelessness and helplessness, this feeling that we can't do anything about it. So when we're actually engaged and we feel like our good works are moving our beliefs in the right direction, we, we feel less hopeless, less powerless, and therefore more able to maintain our own state. Remember the presidential election that the presidential election is not the only one. So be thoughtful with other, with other candidates in the election sphere and don't let your feeling about the top of the ticket be the only place that you're making decisions. Sometimes we can be far more reasonable looking at issues when it's about a congressional candidate or a senatorial candidate or even our local county council candidates than we can with the presidential candidate because so much of the presidential race becomes personality driven um, and other ones often are not nearly as much. Um, Try not to buy into the hyperbole, even when the hyperbole supports your point of view. Is this the worst candidate in history or the worst, you know, all of this stuff. Um, you know, if you're going to say that, then be able to have the evidence to, to demonstrate it. But, or check out the evidence that people are suggesting. Or is it just what people are saying now to make their point? And then finally, vote. Because if you feel stressed now, wait until after the election when the election hasn't gone the way you wanted to and you were the one who sat home, that will really add a whole other load of stress. Now, I thought a good way to end this conversation would be um, with a person who's probably one of the greatest demonstrations of the ability to move past difference and to depersonalize difference, Nelson Mandela, who spent 27 years, of course, in solitary confinement or partial solitary confinement and imprisonment. Um, because of his opposition to apartheid and then came out and became president of his country, his whole country. Rather, probably very few people had more justification for being vindictive and vengeful than Nelson Mandela did. But here's what he said. He said, forget the past, forgive the past. Courageous people do not fear forgiving for the sake of peace. A good leader knows that at the end, he and the other side must be closer and thus emerge stronger. If you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy then he becomes your partner. Now, this is what our task is in front of us. Our task in front of us is to begin to learn to listen to each other again, to begin to put relationship first, to begin to put issues first, to loosen up these identities that we have about the right way to be if you're a Democrat or the right way to be if you're in a Green Party or the right way to be if you're a Republican or the right way to be if you're in the Tea Party and start instead to look at issues and solve problems. It's only then we can really move forward. So before we end, there are just one, there are two quick things I want to share with you. One is um, a new initiative that we've been engaging in at Cook Ross that I'd love to get some of your support in, and that is that we are now reserving 20% of all of the spots in all of our public programs for free participation by people in law enforcement. 
We know that the need to understand bias in law enforcement is so important right now, both from the standpoint of the behavior of law enforcement officers towards citizens, but also to help understand and have empathy and compassion for the way law enforcement officers feel about the way they're treated. And so the more we can help in this way, the more we'd like to. So if you know anybody in law enforcement, if you have any connections to law enforcement agencies, please let them know about this and contact us at either uh, our phone number, 501-565-4035, or at lookingforanswers at cookross.com, and we'll keep you posted. The second is the piece that I talked about earlier, um, which is available for free at www.cookross.com. It's a, it's a the dialogue guide that we've created uh, for inclusive responses in times of fear. And this is not specifically about the political election, but how do we talk about Black Lives Matter at work? How do we talk about some of the other challenging issues that are around us? And um, we've done this simply because we want this to be out there so that people in the public can have a better opportunity to talk about some of these important issues in a healthy way. So that's all the time we have for now. Thank you so much to all of you who participated. Um, it's just such a, a privilege to be able to have this conversation with you. We're facing this election now coming upon us in just a few days. And uh, I know while all of us are, I'm sure most of us are looking for the relief at the end of that, we know that, that really the real work that we'll have to do as a society to bring ourselves back together again will come after November 8th. So I uh, look forward to uh, sharing that work with you. Um, Take care, be well, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's session. Thank you, Howard, for taking us through this content. To disconnect from this session, just go ahead and click on the X in the top right corner of the screen, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Helen.